Right, welcome back to the Arrow Man in Stockholm podcast. Today, I wanted to do an interview for Reuters with Molly McCann, but she's far too interesting just to do one interview and leave it at that. Um, Molly has a book out called Be True to You. And that was one thing that struck me as being amazing because when you're so young in your career, it's very unusual to be writing your life story. Molly, how did you come to write this book? You know what's funny? Because it's not the autobiography, right? It's just, it's it's like, it's only one chapter in my life. But um the way in which it came around is I got a, a new mind coach after my last fight and he totally just, he took me back to the come up mindset. So when you're on the up and everything's like a struggle and you're hungry and you're chasing the dream and, and he made me feel invincible again and like I can do anything I set my mind to. And then I just set myself a, a target in the fact of I like to be a working class hero. So I pride myself on the fact that I had three jobs or two jobs at the age of 14 and I've worked, I worked my whole way through university and um, I come from a family that's working class and I thought I I do quite a lot to raise that kind of, um, to let people know that's what I'm about and I'm really proud to be from that background and then I do a lot for me community in the t- in the sense of I've coached kids for free my whole life all people be it was a football be it boxing be it MMA I've always give back to my community in that way and then I thought what's the last what else can I keep doing to keep giving back because I think it's really important that you keep giving back and then I thought I really haven't the, dove or delved into like the, the gay community and, and me being a gay athlete or just a gay human or a gay person mm. and then I was speaking with my coach and I just I rang him up me man coach Tom and I said Tom I'm going to write a book it's a short illustrated story on about kids coming out and sorry about me coming out to see if my story can help kids so basically, 24 page story of me and my life and why I felt like I couldn't come out and why it did come out. And then there's a space at the back of the book. It's about four pages long that says, here's a space for you to draw your story and tell your story. So coaches, social workers, teachers, parents, they're all going to read this and then and the, well, these are the people that have got in touch with me and said, thank you for your book. I'm using it with my child, a student, um, kids within social the social care um, sector, and just using it as a coming out tool. And um, I just think it's a really important thing that no one's kind of got round to in MMA and football. There's no stigma for women. There's still stigma for men. There's not really stigma for women in MMA. Um, the reason I came out was because my the gym I'm at now and the and another gym that I was at just made me feel so comfortable within my skin that the insecurities didn't matter anymore. And the the prejudice of maybe being in a in a boxing culture gym or a more, I think the word pugilist. Like I'm sure thinking, don't really can't come off that track. It's just no, this is the way it is. Um without being without generalizing and being disrespectful to a certain group of fans, but boxing fans and football fans can be quite similar in that mindset. Whereas um don't get me wrong, MMA fans aren't that dissimilar, but they're a lot more open-minded as in the jujitsu culture, like you can be a world champion in one gym and on one mat and you go to another gym and you're just going to get humbled because there's that many which ways you can lose. You can't kind of be top dog and never and, and be the top and the best at everything. So you learn to be accepting and the culture is we are one. So ethnicity, race, class, gender, sexuality kind of really doesn't matter. In, in my world and what I do. And, and this also stems down to the equality that runs through teaching, it, sorry, pay, payments. Like I get paid the same as what a man would do in the UFC at my level. So we're equal the whole way down the line. 
Okay. Um, so I'm quite fortunate with that. And um, you mentioned there, like, you know, that you, when you got to the gym that you're at now, that you felt comfortable coming out there, you felt the support, you felt the warmth of the people that you train with, right? But if you go back to when you were in secondary school in Liverpool, um, because like I always hate the questions that, you know, oh, when did you realise you were gay? Because it's not something you realise, it's something that you are. But it, how did that struggle manifest itself for you when you're looking at girls, when you have those feelings and you realise that maybe if I do something here, somebody's going to laugh at me, they're going to call yeah. me queer, they're going to call me whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I went to, I moved to a place called Bournemouth around about last year of primary school like and done my full senior school so year 11 to six year seven to 11 in Bournemouth which is a it's very south of England you can't get any more south and then the day I finished school I came back to Liverpool so when I was I was down south because I don't want it to make out I don't want it to come across like Liverpool was the reason I didn't come out because that wasn't the case but what was the case was I was always sport-minded I boxed, I'd done karate, I'd done kickboxing, I was playing football for AFC Bournemouth. I was in places where gay and queer was, was normalised and it was accepted. It, like, it was so accepted where I was and who I grew up with and the football team I was playing for. All these people were gay and that was fine. It was fine that they were. But then I never really had thoughts on really fancying girls and that kind of thing, I think, because I was skittered or or taken the piss out of from the age of 9, 10, 11, because I played sport, that it was like, oh, Molly's fucking gay, e lesbian, blah, blah, blah. That I was just like, I'm not even entertaining that conversation. I'm just going to go right the other way. And that's not to say I went with all boys and that kind of thing. I just chose to, to not go near anyone and to just focus on on being a professional footballer or a professional fighter that's all all I wanted to do and it was really hard the constant teasing the nicknames the the coming in on a Monday morning after everyone's been to house parties or everyone's been to the park or down the beach and knowing that all these people are, are starting to experiment uh, with the opposite sex and having boyfriends and I weren't having sex with people and I weren't going out on dates and I I was just focused on me and that does but it did stem from being too scared to maybe be that way and then like I say when I was 16 I signed for Liverpool ladies I came back to, to Liverpool and it was kind of thrust upon me a lot um, like in them adolescent years and I still wasn't comfortable with it at all and then I went to university and then it became a lot more of an accepting place because you've got past the teasing of high school and senior school and then you get to a place where you're meeting people from different culture different cultures different backgrounds different walks of life and everyone a lot more people are accepting there and then I started to understand myself I started to experiment but I still weren't comfortable with me and this is deep-rooted trauma and issues from just being bullied and laughed and jibbed and prodded about that about gay and in a time where still people probably thought like I don't know why I had such a negative complex on it I really can't tell you like it like it wasn't one thing that made me like Ugh. it was just an accum an accumulation of a lot of things a lot of things a lot of things I think little things just adding up adding up and then I've I was in a relationship for about two and a half years with this guy. Then we split up and then became best friends with me boxing, a boxer, a female boxer. And then we ended up getting together, I suppose. And then it all hit me and I went, oh. <laughs> it was the light bulb moment of, okay, I finally found the one. Do you know what I mean? So maybe I was like, I was just searching the whole time for the person and, and, it, it it ended quite abruptly with this person. It was like a year-long relationship or a bit longer than a year. But my dad was dying at the time and she was helping me nurse him. And it was... Um, it, I was just not in a great space and I don't think I probably treated her with the respect. Well, not the respect, but 
I did, maybe didn't let the relationship flow as long as it needed to, but because of what I was going through internally. But she was very good with being patient about me learning how to come out. And she was very good in teaching me about like gay history and about feminism and about what's right and what's wrong. And then, um, yeah, she's just a really, she's a really good person for, for me to understand me. And then I started, well, I was I was doing MMA then, but that, re- that really just helped intensify and magnify. And my gym and my coach was just like, Molly, we couldn't give like a, a shit if you was like orange and <laughs> like love trees, like whatever, you're you and we like you for you. Do you know what I mean? So um, that was it, but it was a long, and then it was a long time eight of not being using words, trigger words like the word gay or lesbian or the words I've been ridiculed with. Mm. And I'll be okay with these words, do you know? And like, um, say, I was writing the, the book and I was scared to put gay in. And I was like, I need to normalise it because it's normal and it's fine. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was like, it, it was just all mad. Because yeah. ultimately, my mum said, I was more surprised you telling me you was engaged to a man than you are now that you're telling me you're gay. And I was laughing my head off and I was crying, I'm sorry for letting you down, blah, blah, blah. And she was just like, how could you let me down? She's like, I've brought you up around such a different mix of people. It's like, all oh, we best friends are gay men and gay women. Why have you, why would you feel that? Yeah. You know what I mean? But that's like when you were saying about that, then, you know, when you were going to school and you were going through, you, you were in essentially women's football, you were in a gay environment. Right. And yet still you kind of felt that, OK, I'm not willing to step across that line. And that that timing, that's your decision to make. Right. When I grew up in Dublin, obviously, I'm a little bit older than you, but I grew up absolutely terrified of being gay, Molly, because of the way people spoke about it, because the way I spoke about gay people at that time because I didn't know any better and yeah. faggot and queer and picking on somebody who looked different or, you know, some lad who might have been slightly effeminate or that kind of thing. And when I think back to, you know, essentially you can call it fucking bullying, but the torture that we put people through just because of the way they spoke or the way they looked or the way they looked at another fella. And now at fucking 50 years of age, like the regret that you have, because the other thing was that, you know, it was a place of absolute fear for us. I'm, I'm telling you, I was fucking terrified of it growing up that this might be, that this was the way that I might have to live my life, you know? And it's one of those things that what, what strikes me as um, as interesting with you is that, you know, when I think, were you 25 or 26 when you came out to your friends and family? Like, out, oh, yeah. Like, I had to have a conversation of, it. we just experiment, like, when I was younger at university, it was just trying to find my feet with it. And I couldn't feel, I just couldn't. And then I was forced out when I was 25. I was forced out. Um, How does that feel when somebody does that to you? It was horrible, mate, because I, I still don't know if I'd be on, I would definitely be on by now, obviously, but it's that horrible conversation. It's like, it's like breaking up with someone. You just don't want to have that conversation, do you know what I mean? But Because you feel the rejection, you feel of getting banished and getting people not like you anymore for being you and you can't change who you are. Mm. Um, I go for, like... <sighs> the person who I was with got wind of me see- seeing someone else and I knew that they was going to start telling people... It, the person I used to be with, sorry, got foot, got wind of I was now seeing a woman. And um I remember I got a message, I know your dirty fucking secret. And then I just sent a picture of me and said person like that. Like there's not a date, like there's not a dirty or a secret here, do you know what I mean? And I just had to like take her on the chin and be like, okay, I've got to come out before I'm ready. It's like it's like being a parent. You're never going to be ready, so you just got to, like, embrace it. And that's kind of... It was just ripped the Band-Aid off for me. But I remember saying to my mum, you're going to have to ring everyone. And then I'd, I rang my cousin. I said, I need to tell you something. I can't tell you. I'm going to have to text today. And she, she rang me back and she was like, I'm so proud of you. Why would you feel 
the need to lie and deny who you are, blah, blah, blah. And all of my cousins who joked with me about it and give me even a bit of a complex growing up, was just like, we all, like, it's fine. What are you going on about? <laughs> you fucking said it. You was taking the piss out of me my whole life for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But when you call I'm Irish Catholic background, it's just everyone takes the piss out of everyone. It is what it is. But obviously, only now speaking about my experience, because I never spoke about it until I had to release this book. Only now, they're like, shit, really? Is that the reason why? I'm like, yeah. Um, but the best thing is everyone's taking accountability. Like, we are in a snowflake generation where you probably can't say much be- unless people are going to ram it down your throat and give you an opinion. But we are also a generation now who go, going, I fucked up there. I'm sorry that I made you feel like that. How can I make amends? It's like, I've forgotten about it, really, but, yeah, just an apology is enough for me. And the release of the book, the amount of people who I went to school with, best friends, family people, rang me up and said, I'm really sorry that affected you and I could have played a part in that. Mm. I said, it's OK. Um, one of the interesting things that somebody said to me once about coming out was, when you come out, you don't change people's perception of you does they're the ones that change not you now i know that somebody close to you i've seen you say before had quite a negative reaction to you and you couldn't really be friends or conduct a relationship with that person how hurtful was that for you at that time at that time i couldn't understand why when this person i'm so proud of right this person is an amazing athlete, he's a fighter. He was my best friend and we I've got an openly gay friend called Sean who's a fighter as well. So me and Sean, two openly gay people, said person is best friends with us both. And now when I look at it, I understand he was an adolescent male of 19 who just didn't understand it. He just was like, what? how like you've just been in a place like it just blew his mind and he had been conditioned to think like it was it was we're cool with gays but you can't be one do you know what I mean like and then this is the this is the, the best thing like I forgave him instantly because I knew I know how his brain thinks and he just wasn't educated on the situation and he's now a dad he's now um, he's an amazing man, he's with an amazing woman and he rang me up on Monday, the day after that interview went live and he rang me up and he apologised and he went, I'm fucking so sorry but he didn't realise either the effect he just thought it was like a conversation and that to come from someone who I know is very conditioned to be a certain way it blew my mind to how much he's grown and I was just buzzing with the fact of like he's took accountability for his behavior he's apologized for it and like I really he's not a homophobic person but he was ill-educated and it would have been like you as a kid uh, and the the bullying of the unknown and that's all it was I think he was scared I think he thought he was going to lose his best friend and a lot of things came into play and he, he just wasn't great with expressing his feelings. So he, he, he was just very, he just said shit. I, I don't think he probably even meant, but but then it's being said. So um, I'm so proud of him for taking accountability and and the man he's turned into. You're, you're very forgiving of people, Molly, because, you know, like you say, this guy is not homophobic. I kind of... You know, argue the toss a little bit there that you know you know the way we use words like racist or we use words like homophobic and to me there almost there's too much power in those words right because i was homophobic as a teenager it wasn't yeah. intentional it was through ignorance and luckily people like yourself and others have taken the trouble to fucking educate me so i'm not anymore right and it's the same thing when it comes to racism but you seem to be very understanding of people like your friend there um but does it ever sort of you know when you see what's going on in hungary at the moment where they're passing laws uh, I was reading today that there's rules now where LGBT uh, people are, uh, you can't talk about these things in schools, this kind of thing. Right? How, like, do you react with anger to that? You know, because I mean, you're a fighter, you know what I mean? This is- it's like, <clears throat> I watched, 
in my spare time, I watch a lot of documentaries on sports people and great sports people. And I watched, I literally watched one. There's a few reasons I am who I am. And it comes from a lifetime of hate and pain. And it comes through from a, a background of just knowing nothing but pain. Do I want people to be in the same feeling that? No, I don't. If someone's genuinely apologised, I'm going to I'm gonna forgive you and just, like, make amends and we can push forward. Do you know what I mean? And I come from a... Fa- it, my, my mum's in recovery. And from a young age, I was aware of the 12-step programme. And it's like, you're just taught not to judge and, and forgive. And if I held on to all, every person who's given me shit, I'm not going to live a happy life, mate. And... Coming back to what I just said, I watched Serena Williams' a documentary on her on Amazon Prime. She was speaking about Nelson Mandela. No, I'm not saying I'm either of these people, but what I am saying is I've took from what they've said. And, and Nelson Mandela literally said, um, Serena Williams is in this, this place where every time she's at, um, I think it was the American Open, they're being very racist. Like, she stepped onto the court, they're booing it, every, like all this kind of thing, and then she was like, I'm not going back. And then she spoke with Nelson Mandela, and he was just like, he forgave everyone who persecuted him, who put him in in prison, everyone everyone who ever harmed him, everyone he just forgave. And he, he carries the power, not them. And then she said the same thing. All these racist people and all these people who want to dig their oar in and everything towards here, she has to let go. You have to let go of the pain. Do you know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. Have I had absolute war with people? Have I gone to war with people and told them my point of view? Absolutely. But the second that the sorry words mentioned, like then it's done. And like, and the world needs to be a little bit more like that. You can't just keep carrying that. But then I am aware, like it could make me a bit soft. And pe- some people will try and um, manipulate me. Like I'm aware of the manipulation and the false, a false sorry and that kind of thing. But then, my mum said it's the best. The best part of me is that, and don't let the world like change that about me. Do you know what I mean? Do you get a lot of abuse now? Like you know, on social media that kind of thing because. Um, it is one of those things that as a fighter in the public eye, every time you fight the UFC, there's millions of people around the world watching. There are millions of people from all sorts of backgrounds. They're religious, they're non-religious, they're right wing, they're left wing. People like me will come out and sort of hold up a rainbow flag for you. Other people will be sort of, you know, spitting at your Instagram, you know. Does that affect you? And is it something that, you know, are you trying to use these platforms for change? You can't be in, in an influencing situation and not be a positive influence. So if there's a hot topic or something's in the media and it needs a positive voice, I'm going to educate myself the best I can and try and push a forward positive message. Um, Did the hate at the beginning? Yeah. When I was just on Cage Warriors before I was a world champion, I was just coming up, I was having dormant, the doorman in Liverpool City Centre attacking me on Twitter, trolling me, you fucking dirty die. Did that hit you? Do you know what I mean? Did that condition me to be water off a duck's back and build a thick skin? Yeah, it did. The worst thing you can say to me is I'm gay. What else have you got for me? Because, like, I don't feel bad about being who I am. I understand in recent years I've been more... I'm starting to get more comfortable in my skin and I'm starting to be able to not ram it down your throat because I won't speak about it all the time. When pride's on, it's about educating and it's like, don't don't give so much to where people are climatised and don't want to listen to it. Don't ram it and force it into people's views. Do you know what I mean? But I'm just going to be that person who I'm going to try and... Ed- I'm just going to try and make people understand it's fucking hateful and it's hard and and... No one understands how hard sitting down and having to, having to come out is. It's not just to your family and your friends. It's every conversation you have. You got a girl, Have you got a boyfriend now? Oh, you've got a girlfriend. So, like that will happen a lot. But the older you get, the more comfortable you get. I think, and you're sure of yourself. You get. Or oh, I have, and I think mine's come through martial arts. But 
you have to be aware of who you're dealing with and people's mental capacity. Sorry. Um, am I going to change the view of a certain religious faith and a, a faith that's been going back way, 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 when and that they still think like killing a gay person, lynching a gay person, stoning a gay person to death is okay. I'm not going to change that person's mind. So if they're going to troll me, fucking go for it. I couldn't give a fuck. I um, I said to the UFC a lot, I said to BT Sport, if I can be an aide, if I can do anything to help, I'm going to do it. And then every time we've put something on, it's a certain part of the world or a certain culture who just troll. And then I'm cool with that because you're not, I'm not, you, you couldn't even, to these people, a woman isn't even okay if she has a job, like the woman has to stay at home. So I've got no fucking chance of swaying them. So I'm just going to work on the people I can. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, what would you like to achieve with the book, Molly? Because it came out on the last day of June, which is Pride Month around the world. Um, by the last day of June next year, what would you like people to be saying about your book? Or what would you like to achieve? Um, I want to do another one. I want to do another one, and I want it to be based around my best friend, Cal Callie Sean, who's a gay fighter. Um, I've just become an ambassador for Stonewall, and they do lots of stuff about the laces. And I'm going to do work with them as a, as a, a sports champion I am for them. So I'm going to do all I can to be... to go into certain... I don't know, media obligations or functions and speak and educate. And I want to do, do you know the rainbow laces that the footballers wear? I have them in my boots. So, you know, they, 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 oh shit, they have a armband as well. Henderson always wears it. Um, what's his name? I only say that because I probably think you're a Liverpool fan because you're, you're Irish. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. My dad's an Everton fan, so you love oh, well, that. So am I, so am I. But, um, I put the laces in my boxing gloves and I was literally on the phone to someone. Oh, Stonewall said we'd like you to help us with the Stonewall lace campaign in September when the season starts. I was like, perfect. I just thought it's great. And then I was sitting there going, I'm going to see if I can get as many MMA fighters and as many boxers together and put them in a boxing glove and make them a bit longer. And can I see if I can help fighters start that change and start that movement and like i know ellen DeGeneres doesn't get good press anymore because of what she she's done like in in the last few years but she changed the tide for gay and queer people to be able to come out and all that kind of thing in america and um my mum says to me you need to pick your fight and who you're fighting for and first and foremost i'll always fight for for my community it's going to be liverpool and it's going to be the um the lgbtq plus community so i think i really think i'd like to um that's going to be me calling i think it the book is what's opened the door and the conversation and my tool to get me foot in the door and something like that mm -hmm. um but i think if i can help it could you imagine how many males play football and, and can't come out how many males fight and can't come out um I want this to kind of be known. <clears throat> this is what I'm going to start saying to people as like the, the thing that gets their attention that they can listen to. And it's like, you're not going to get any more homoph homophobic abuse than I get. So why not? So why not? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what's the difference? It's, it's actually like it's a very simple equation because, I mean, it's a question that I still ask, you know, in American sport, in British sport, in European sport, in men's sport in general. And I do think it's kind of rooted in the fear that people like me had growing up, you know. But I just wanted to ask you one last question about Molly, about you mentioned at the start of our conversation about your working class roots and how proud you are of that. Right. But I wanted to ask you about the book, because reading is one of those things that is not immediately associated with working class people. Right. And you're smiling at me now. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what, what was your relationship to reading as a kid or growing up? Um, I always struggled. I could tell a story. I was creative. I could write poems. I couldn't spell, you know, like my gram grammatically correct now. Like, I've just really struggled. And 
and that comes down to lack of care or lack of it's a classist thing isn't it like the lower class you are the more working class you're going to come from more deprived areas and the resources aren't there so this is why do you know what I mean like I went to university I've got a degree so I managed to to get through all that kind of thing but to change the generation and the way people are thinking I was think, how can I do that and it's like it's it's the kids you have to change the kids perception and the next one's coming up and I'm not saying you can't change people your age you can't change older people you can't change people my age but if we can change the thinking from there then the next ones have got half got a chance and do people fear coming out as much now who are 15 16 17 absolutely not do you know what I mean but my book is to hit people on maybe a sport scale maybe a I don't know what it's like like in in I don't even know like a lawyer like a, a solicitor like that kind of way can people can people be openly gay there I don't know do you know what I mean but I know the thought wasn't so much about I knew I could write I could write my autobiography I just would have to take a little four month booster class on my mind's just full of fighting and filtering through interviews and business and that kind of thing I haven't had to send emails for eight years do you know what I mean and then I've took on this passion project where I'm doing press releases I'm speaking to media I'm constantly sending emails and then I'm having to write a book and like I was just like that whoa I haven't done our fucking bite off more than I can chew, but it was a shot and it was like, I've just, it's like I'm, I'm blindfolded and I'm coming out swinging. Like that's how I approached this, this project. And I just used just common sense as best as I could. But when I wrote the book, the first person I really told was my sister. And I sat down, I've got a nephew who's six. And I said, I'm going to come to yours. I'm going to write this story. And we're going to do it in a language Freddie's going to understand. Now, me and my sister are very literate anyway. Um, I, because I think Scousers type, type spell how we speak. And because we don't speak the Queen's English, we tend to spell things wrong. And I just was there with my sister and I, um, I just wrote it. It's as simple as it could. Like, Molly went to big school and just tried to keep it very... Not too heavy, not too shocking, not too diluting the story of the pain. Do you know what I mean? And I've got a friend called Danielle Magne, and um, she bought the book and read it to her nephews. And on my Instagram, you can see the, I put a video on and she sent me it. And I was like, I was sat there with my mum and I was like, started getting choked up because this is, this is what was like a really amazing moment for me was, and how life's kind of changed now is you've got this kid who's like five or six reading this story and it's saying like Molly was bullied in school a lot and he was like because she liked girls and he was like but why is she being bullied for that I don't understand and then for me I was it was the most powerful little minute and I was like oh like I think they're very working class as well the the, the kids and that family and it was just like life is changing and and Liverpool is like that city mentality where everyone's accepted really anyway, do you know what I mean? So it's only if they've got nothing else to, to take the piss out of you, you're probably getting jibbed with that. And and like I say, like you need to educate people on sometimes. You can't always joke and, and it'd be funny about your sexuality when you've been hate a lot. So if, you, if you've come out and you're absolutely fine then it, and you haven't got insecurities in it, jokes like that, probably won't offend you but it's still not you shouldn't do it's not funny do you know what I mean because it can offend someone else well that's the thing I mean to me with those things you own that you own that space you own your story you set the bar right so if you make a joke to me about it that's the line I can go to and I can go no further because you've already told me I'm comfortable with this I'm comfortable with these words with describing myself in this way and then it's not up to me to push the envelope and try to push that further I have to play within your boundaries as I do with anybody who's you know religious or who has you know whatever belief somebody has because at the end of the day it comes down to respect it comes down to respecting who you are and if there's something that, you know, over the last few years when I got to know you on social media and got to know you through your, your career there, it's uh, that respect has just grown and grown and continues to grow. And thank you so much for taking the time 
and being so honest with me today. No problem, lad. It's um, it's the one thing about me. I just think is like it gets me in trouble a lot. Just how honest I am. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And <laughs> if I'm having a bad day, mate, you're gonna fucking know about it. Yeah. If I'm having a good day, you're gonna know. But at least you always know where to stand. But that's the thing. And, and that kind of honesty is uh, it's sorely lacking in sports today but we know we'll always get it out of you like I don't like I remember I was getting Everton do a lot with me and they was I got, I've got a friend here mission he used to work for Everton as a journalist he's like maybe we could just like tidy up your interviews I went mate Wayne Rooney's like a hero of mine and I won't listen to one of his conversations except but people know it's pure raw emotion with me am I going to scream is it annoying yeah am I going to swear pardon me is it very late like probably not like but people still want to listen do you know what I mean so um I'm very lucky at the sport that I'm in you're okay to be you do you know what I mean? like you can be you and and celebrated for it and I think football and boxing there's like the code of conduct where you can't kind of cross that line like I'm allowed to put online, like, say if I'm, like, going out getting drunk with my mates, I can put that all on social media. Footballers, other people like that can't. Do you know what I mean? Because they just get to, like, they, well, they get in trouble with the FA, but it's about building that relationship, I suppose. And But you'd never have a situation where the UFC would say, Molly, we didn't like that picture, or can you change that? Or you wouldn't get that kind of thing? No. Like, I lost two fights on the bounce... And I like I literally after my last fight thought I was about to get like caught. And one of the lads went, You're joking, aren't you? It was like he said, You want to see the analytics whenever you're on? Um because no interview's ever the same and there's no script and I'm not lying. And it's always it's honest. So people don't want to listen to people being genuine or the underdog, do you know what I mean? So Speaking of which, has anybody actually offered you the chance to write your autobiography yet? Because I'll fucking buy it. Um, I I won't do that till I've finished. Because in MMA, <clears throat> I think like I'll finish in boxing because I started amateur boxing, didn't get to become professional. I think I'll finish there. And after then, I've done that. There's a lot, there's too much pain for me to keep working through, like counseling wise. That, like I can't kind of just sit in this in that space. That that's gonna be like when I'm finally I've completed like I'm close to enlightenment, then it's coming because it's gonna like people will have no idea what I've been through. And I'm not out here to be an X Factor story just yet. I'm gonna be the success story, you know, like like me getting upset over this kind of thing, or like I don't want to be a martyr. I'm not trying to be like you can't joke with me or you can't say that. Like I'm not, but I'm like it's triggering to always have to keep on living. Like this last month's been really hard because I've had to keep li- living through coming out again and again and again. And 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 then it's not gone down well with some people who felt disrespected be- because they didn't realize they was offensive. Do you know what I mean? And it's like I'm losing relationships as many as I'm gaining. Mm-hmm. I'm not losing relationships. I'm having awkward conversations that we have to navigate through because people didn't realize how I felt. Yeah. And then it's a shock to them because they love me so much. Mm. Do, you know, do you know what I mean? So, they don't realize the effect that they're having on you, that the things that they're saying and how they're not even it's not even like a long effect. It's just like someone thinks that it's it's something's being funny and I just haven't liked it. But it's not like I'm not going to sit there and hold on to it because I'm a, I'm a forgiven pe- Like mm. It's just, it'll be with me for an hour and then it'll be gone. Do you know what I mean? So, Are you looking forward to getting back to not having to talk about these things for a little while when the book is done? Yeah, like you're the last one. You're the last <laughs> one. <laughs> I'm fucking <laughs> done after this. <laughs> yeah, no, I stopped. Uh, actually, do you know what? You're not the last one you've got. I've got BBC. No, we have got. I'm going to tell you because it's actually really good. Emma Jones. It's BBC Radio London and BBC London TV. Mm. I mean, it's it's almost like you've been the only gay in the village now, like in Little Britain. I don't want to be the token gay, do you know what I mean? But (laughs) it's like, if I'm the only one who's got the bollocks, I've finally got the um, the kahunias to talk about it. I mean, I always joke and say it only took me 25 rotations of the sun to be true to me, do you know what I mean? But um, I finally got there anyway, lad. 
which will be plenty more of them hopefully listen again thanks very much for talking to me and for your honesty molly no problem lads.